it's exam week, so let's go. Hello and welcome to Shotgun Q&A. My name is Dr. Moses Kazevu. This is season one, episode four. We shall continue with obstetrics and gynecology. If you haven't yet subscribed to the channel, please hit the subscribe button, hit the bell notification icon to be receiving notifications of such videos every time I post on our road to 2K subscribers. Tell a friend to tell a friend that it is exam week on the channel. As I promised, there will be more videos that will be released on this channel concerning the different series that we look at to prepare students for exams. This is of course shotgun Q&A where we will look at 50 MCQ questions but because this is obstetrics and gynecology we tend to look at 60 MCQ questions. Be prepared because data is going to be flowing like rain. And remember there are some preliminaries or ground rules. You can actually pause the video before I give you the answer note down your answers and keep progress, keep track. Then of course, count your total out of 60, not 50. I don't know how I don't change that to 60 for OBS and Gain, but that should have been just um, a mistake on my end. So we'll begin with question one. At the state level, which of the following is used to define fetal death? Option A, fetal death greater than 20 weeks gestation. Option B, fetal death with a birth weight of greater than 500 grams. C, any fetal death regardless of the gestational age. D, each has been used. So you can pause the video right now at any point. And here comes the answer. So all of these definitions have actually been used. Death after the age of viability, which is roughly, it differs in different uh, countries. Some put it at age of 24 weeks. Some people put it at the age of 28 weeks. But of course, if someone dies and the baby is uh, greater than 500 grams, you will refer to that as fetal death or any death regardless of the gestational age. All these definitions have been used. So question two, delivery at what age divides preterm from term gestations? A, 34 weeks. B, 36 weeks. C, 37 weeks. D, 38 weeks. You may pause the video at this point. Do not forget to be keeping track of your answers and give yourself a total at the end. So remember that term pregnancies are 37 weeks. Um, once you are delivering before 37 weeks, you call that as a preterm delivery. Then question three, the anterior abdominal wall is innervated by all except which of the following? A, subcostal nerve, B, internal pudendal nerve, C, intercostal nerves T7 to T11, D, iliohypogastric nerve, which is L1. So again, this is one of those questions where you either know it or you don't because this is an anatomy related question. So the answer there is internal pudendal nerve, which does not supply the anterior abdominal wall. Question four, the cervix contains little of which of the following components? A, elastin, B, collagen, C, smooth muscles, D, proteoglycans. So which of the following is in the least concentrations in the cervix? You may pause the video now and the answer obviously will be smooth muscles. Remember that the cervix is not a muscular structure. So it means that if a placenta actually implants in that area, remember the mechanism by which the bleeding stops in the uterus, it's because the smooth muscles surrounding blood vessels squeeze and clamp on the blood vessels. But because there's a very low um, amount of smooth muscles in the cervix, if the placenta was attached in the cervix, like in the placenta previa, there is a high chance that the blood vessels will keep bleeding regardless of the uterus actually being contracted because they have very little smooth muscles in the cervix. Question five, the uterine artery is the main branch of which of the following vessels? A, iliolumbar artery, B, common iliac artery, C, external iliac artery, D, internal iliac artery. So you can pause the video right now and scream the answer at your screen or write it down on a piece of paper. You may get it wrong because this is again one of those things where you either know it or you don't. And here comes the answer. So it's a branch of the internal iliac artery. Question six, classically, the pathogenesis of malarian defect involves which of the following? Part A, a genesis of one mesonephric duct. B, duplication of one paramesonephric duct. 
C, faulty fusion of two mesonephric ducts. D, none of the above. So you may pause the video at this point. So the answer is none of the above. So none of the above actually define what a, a Mullerian defect actually is. So moving on to question seven, which of the following is more common, is the more common uterine Mullerian anomaly? A, uterine agenesis, B, biconuate uterus, C, uterine didelphias, then D, uniconuate uterus. Again, this is one of the things where you either know it or you don't. Either you've come across it or you haven't. So you may pause the video right now, scream at your screen if you may. The answer comes and here is the answer. Of course, it's a biconuate uterus. Then question eight, changes in maternal blood volume and cardiac output in pregnancy may mimic which of the following disease states? A, hypertension, B, thyrotoxicosis, C, diabetes insipidus, D, chronic renal disease. So you may pause the video now, but remember that in pregnancy, there are changes that are happening in the cardiac output, there are changes that happen in blood volume. Remember that one? cause of high output cardiac failure is actually pregnancy and even thyrotoxicosis. So most likely that the answer is thyrotoxicosis. Question nine, regarding Braxton Hicks contractions, which of the following is true? A, their intensity varies between 20 and 40 millimeters of mercury. B, they occur early in pregnancy and may be palpated in the second trimester. C, late in pregnancy, these contractions become more regular and may cause discomfort. D, both B and C. You may pause the video right now. If you're hearing Braxton Hicks contractions for the first time, then I think you should do a bit of some reading. So these are known as practice contractions. Um, and they are actually seen early in pregnancy. You can actually palpate them in the second trimester and the, the frequency actually tends to increase as you get to the later trimester. So both B and C are correct. Question 10, average blood loss for a vaginal delivery is which of the following? A, 500 mils, B, 1000 mils, C, half of that lost during cesarean delivery of twins, D, A, and C. Again, this is one of the things where you either know it or you don't. So here, most likely the answer is 500 mils. So the answer is A. Remember when you have more than this loss, then you're terming this as a postpartum hemorrhage. Then question 11, Regarding the bladder during pregnancy, which of the following is true? A, there is an increase in bladder capacity. B, absolute and functional length of the urethra increases. C, bladder pressure decreases from 15 to 8 centimeters of water by term. D, approximately three-fourths of all pregnant women experience incontinence during pregnancy. So you may pause the video right now. So remember that as the pregnancy goes further along the weeks, the size of the uterus increases. This causes compression of the bladder. So it means that the bladder volume is going to be greatly reduced. Even the capacity is going to be greatly reduced. Even we notice that pregnant women are actually going to be going to the bathroom much more frequent than the non-pregnant folks. Then you also have the effects of certain hormones such as progesterone, which actually tends to relax smooth muscles. But most likely what we have noticed is that there is actually increases in both the absolute and the functional urethral length in pregnant women. So most likely B is the answer. Question 12. Which hormone is required for the late stage development of antral follicles? And of course, notice how I've, I haven't put these questions in any sort of order like in the previous video. And I think it's much easier for me to combine everything at once so that it gives you a much more stronger brain workout than actually preparing your mind for gain or preparing your mind for obs. So which of the following hormones is required for the late stage development of antral follicles? A, estradiol, B, androstenone, uh, C, luteinizing hormone, D, follicle stimulating hormone. You may pause the video right now. And of course, this should make sense. If you've read about the menstrual cycle and you have also read about development of these follicles, you should know that it is follicle stimulating hormone that's responsible for this. Question 13, which cells of the dominant follicle are responsible for estrogen production during the follicular phase of the menstrual cycle? A, the theca cells, B, the decidual cells, C, the granulosa cells, and D, the endometrial cells. Again, this is to do with the menstrual cycle and the uh, related 
physiology and related histology of these components. So if you have read on those, you would know that the granulosa cells are the ones that are responsible for production of the estrogen. Then which prostaglandin plays a role in vasoconstriction of spiral arteries leading to menstruation? A, prostaglandin E1, B, prostaglandin E2, D, prostaglandin D2, and I mean C, prostaglandin D2, and D, prostaglandin F2 alpha. Again, this is one of these things that you either know or don't know, but let me just give you a background for where you get this prostaglandin. Remember that phospholipids in the body can be broken down into arachidonic acid by phospholipase A. Two. Now, this arachidonic acid can enter one of two pathways. It can enter the lipooxygenase pathway catalyzed by the lipooxygenase enzyme to produce leukotrienes, or it can enter the cyclooxygenase pathway catalyzed by cyclooxygenase enzymes 1 and 2, producing prostaglandins and prostacyclins, which is where these prostaglandins are coming from. And it has actually been seen that it is prostaglandin F2 alpha that is responsible for the contraction of the spiral arteries and therefore leading to menstruation. So your answer there will be D. Question 15. Which of the following is most consistently associated with placenta abruption? A. Subamnionic hematoma. B. Subchorial thrombosis. C. Retroplacental hematoma. D. Perivillous fibrin deposition. So you can pause the video right now. The answer is most likely a retroplacental hematoma. We actually see that consistently with patients that have a placenta abruption. Which of the following cancers most frequently metastasizes to the placenta? A, colon, B, gastric, C, ovarian, D, melanoma. I already know which answer you're probably going to guess. And I'll tell you. And don't freak out because I'm not a magician or anything. I know most of you are going to guess C, which is ovarian cancer, which is false. And melanoma is actually the most common cancer that metastasizes to the placenta. So the answer there would be D. Question 17. Which route of bacterial in inoculation causes most cases of chorioamnionitis or intrauterine infection? A. Hematogenous spread from maternal blood. B. Direct spread through the fallopian tubes. C. Ascension from the lower reproductive tract. D. Needle inoculation during intraamniotic procedures. You may pause the video right now, but here using common sense. It's not so easy for something to get from the bloodstream, from the mother to the fetus. Not so easy, unless if it's lipid soluble, or unless it has a carrier, or unless some hormones are influencing its movement. Spread from the fallopian tube also to the uterus is not so easy because there are different layers that this has to go through. Needle, maybe with the needle inoculations, it may be common, but not as common as with ascension of the lower respiratory, uh, the lower reproductive tract. Most likely in the background of this child, the membrane actually having ruptured and then this person not going into labor. So it predisposes for bacteria to ascend and cause chorioamnionitis. That's actually the most common cause. So the answer will be C. Which of the following risk factors is most commonly associated with chorioamnionitis? A. Maternal drug use. B. Maternal uh, hygiene. C. Prior cesarean section. D. Uh, prolonged rupture of membranes. Again, I think I've already alluded to this in the previous question. So most likely it's something to do with the membranes, prolonged rupture of membranes. So question 19, the multiple small raised lesions of amnion nodosum are most commonly associated with which of the following conditions? A, oligohydramnios, B, chorioamnionitis, C, meconium staining, D, placenta abruption. If you haven't heard of this condition, now is the time to pause the video and Google what it is. Then come back and answer the question. You can pause the video right now. And here comes the answer, most likely oligohydramnios. Question 20. Pregnancy can be divided into three units or trimesters, each lasting how many weeks? If you get this wrong, please just log off, go study. I'm just kidding. So A, 12 weeks, B, 13 weeks, C, 15 weeks, D, 16 weeks. So this, I think, should give you one out of 20 so far if you've gotten all the others wrong. If you get this wrong, then I don't know. So most likely it's 13 weeks. Age is divided into 13 weeks. Question 21. At 28 weeks gestation, what is the chance of survival without physical or neurological impairment? A, 10%. B, 25%. C, 50%. D, 90%. So what's the chance of this child surviving outside the uterus? You may pause the video right now. So remember that... 
most of the times what really kills the children is either if they do not have any physiological or physical or neurological impairment what is going to kill them is the pulmonary development and remember by 28 weeks the there is some lung development for the child to actually survive outside the uterus and we have some preemies that have survived so more than 90 percent in uh, this type of children that actually survive Question 22, all except which of the following pass through the placenta by simple diffusion? IgG, water, oxygen, anesthetic gas. So which of the following do not pass through the placenta by simple diffusion? And obviously here, the only molecule that can do this is IgG, though it can pass through the placenta, but it's not through the process of simple diffusion. Then question 23, amniotic fluid volume peaks at which gestational age? A, 24 weeks, B, 28 weeks, C, 32, 34 weeks, D, 38 weeks. So if you have watched my video on polyhydramnios, by the way, I have a playlist on obstetrics and gynecology. I will leave it linked at the end of this video. So here is the answer. So it peaks most likely at 34 weeks. The order in which hemopoiesis is seen in the embryo or fetus from the earliest to the latest is which of the following? A. Liver, yolk sac, bone marrow. B. Yolk sac, liver, bone marrow. C. Bone marrow, liver, yolk sac. D. Yolk sac, bone marrow, liver. Remember that in the first trimester of pregnancy, most of the red blood cells are going to be synthesized from the mesenchyme, which is a derivative of the mesoderm, which is from the yolk sac then or part of the yolk sac then in the second trimester you enter what is known as the hepatic stage where you're going to be synthesizing it mostly from the liver and some even from the spleen some from other reticular endothelial systems then of course the tr third trimester in, onwards in life it's going to be what is known as the myeloid stage where synthesis is happening from the bone marrow so your answer there would be b yolk sac liver and bone marrow Question 25, birth defects are responsible for what percentage of infant mortality? This is another question where you either know it or you don't. Question A or part A, 2%, part B, 5%, part C, 10%, part D, 20%. I know most of you are going to guess 10%, but it's actually 20%. Question 26, preconception, uh, supplementation, and fortification of food products with folate has had what impact on pregnancy outcomes? A, reduced the rate of preeclampsia. B, reduced the incidence of seizures, childhood seizures. C, reduced the incidence of neurotube defect. D, reduced the incidence of spontaneous abortion. So you may pause the video, reread the question to make sense of it. What they're simply asking you is why, what has folate, as giving folate in pregnant women, what has this reduced? And we've seen that folate is very essential for the development of the nervous system. So it actually helps in reducing the neurotube defects. Question 27, we're almost halfway. Which of the following is the most common pregnancy complication in women older than the age of 35 years? So increasing maternal age. A, diabetes. B, hypertension. C, preterm birth. D, low birth weight. I already know what most of you are going to guess. And most of you are probably going to guess option B. But the answer is actually option A, which is diabetes. Question 28. Which of the following women could be classified as nally gravida? A, a 30-year-old old woman who has never been pregnant. B, a 23-year-old who is pregnant for the first time at 22 weeks gestation. C, a 25-year-old woman who is six weeks postpartum after her first delivery. Then part D, a 34-year-old woman who has had two previous pregnancies that ended in miscarriage at eight weeks gestation. So remember, a nalligravida woman is someone who has never been pregnant before. So most likely A is the answer. But let me just give you a background of these other options. So remember that option B here, if you have been pregnant for the first time, then you call that as a prime gravida. Option C there, this person has delivered, so is a prime gravida and a primiparous woman. Then option D, this woman has been pregnant twice, so this woman is gravida three if she's pregnant for the third time, but um, para zero, meaning that, uh, or gravida two on para zero, meaning that she's been pregnant twice, but hasn't delivered any uh, infant beyond term. Question 29, how should a woman who has had four pregnancies delivered at term 
one of which at, it was a twin pregnancy be designated A, gravida 5, para 4, B, gravida 4, para 5, C, gravida 4, para 4, D, gravida 5, para 5. You may pause the video right now. So I know most of you are probably going to guess wrong and there will be some arguments here. But we all agree that regardless of whether it's a twin pregnancy or regardless of whether it is a single tone pregnancy, we count that as one gravida because you can't get pregnant more than once. So most likely this woman will be at gravida four. So that already rules out option A and that rules out option D. So that leaves us with option B and option C. And then of course, if you deliver, this woman has delivered four times. So most likely it's going to be option C. Gravida four, para four. Then question 30, the accuracy of gestational age dating using the last menstrual period is affected by which of the following? A, anovulatory bleeding. B, menstrual cycle length. C, oral contraceptive use. D, all of the above. So which of the following would affect the date uh, of the pregnancy if you're using dating by dates? I don't know if that makes sense. But you remember that pregnancies could be dated by uh, dates. They could be dated by the ultrasound. Okay. So most likely all these things do affect the last menstrual period and they affect the regularity of the menstrual period. So most likely all of the above. So question 31, the uterus and fallopian tubes arise from the following structures, A, Wolfian ducts, B, Mullerian ducts, C, urogenital sinus, D, cyanovaginal bulbs, E, mesonephric ducts. So here comes the answer, the arising from the Mullerian ducts. So question 32, what is the single most accurate biometric predictor of gestational age? A, crown rump length, B, head circumference, C, abdominal circumference, D, gestational sac mean diameter. So these are just biometric predictors that you usually check for when you're doing your ultrasound to determine the gestational age. And most likely the crown ramp length is the one that's the most accurate biometric predictor. So question 33, the fetal head circumference should be measured in which of the following views? A, transatrial view, B, transthalamic view, C, transcerebellar view, D, any of the above acceptable. So if you're at fifth year and you get this wrong, don't crucify yourself. If you're at seventh year and you get it wrong, I'm not going to say crucify yourself. Don't crucify yourself because at the end of this video, you will actually know the answer. So most likely here, this is a transthalamic view. So question 34, which is which of the following biometric parameters measured in the second trimester has the greatest variation for gestational age estimation? A, female length, B, head circumference, C, biparietal diameter, D, abdominal circumference. So which one has the greatest variation? So if we actually look at each of these, the first three, actually, the variation isn't so much. But with abdominal circumference, we have a very, very huge variation, and we do not actually use it as a reliable measure of gestational age. So question 35, in a normal fetus at term, what is the daily volume of urine, fetal urine, that contributes to the amount of amniotic fluid present? A, 250 mils, B, 500 mils, C, 750 mils, D, 1,000 mils. So how much urine does the fetus produce at term? So most likely this fetus produces 1,000 mils. I know most of you are going to get 750 or 250. So question 36, and yes, you have swam in your urine before, you have drank your urine or swallowed your urine before. I know, it's pretty nasty. Amniotic fluid volume is a balance between production and reabsorption. What is the primary mechanism of fluid reabsorption? A, fetal breathing. B, fetal swallowing. C, absorption across fetal skin. D, absorption and filtration by fetal kidneys. I think I've already given you the answer. That by virtue of me saying you've once swallowed or drank your urine, that's probably the answer. So it's fetal swallowing. Remember that in the first trimester, it's going to be through the absorption of the membranes, exudation and um, absorption, or transudation rather, and absorption. Then in the last trimester, it's going to be through urination as well as swallowing. That's the balance. So question 37, oligohydramnios is defined as which of the following? Amniotic fluid index less than 5 centimeter, single deepest pool less than 2 centimeters, amniotic fluid index less than 90th percent, and then all of the above. 
So remember that uh, oligohydramnios is a condition where there is reduced amniotic fluid index. There is also a reduced amniotic fluid volume and the single deepest pool is also reduced. Remember that the amniotic fluid index is between 5 to about 25, if I'm not mistaken. How we calculate this is we divide the uterus into four con compartments. Then we take the single deepest pool uh, from each of the compartments and we find an average. Then... A uh, single deepest pool is just the deepest, the length of the deepest pool. It's usually two to about um, eight. So if you have less than two, that's oligohydramnios. And then of course, the third one. So if you get a scenario where you know two options that are correct and the third one you're not so sure and there's an all of the above, it's most likely that it's an all of the above option unless if it's a true or false scenario. So most likely this is all of the above. So question 38, which of the following is a clinical sign of polyhydramnios? A, tense uterus, B, increase in fundal height measurement, C, inability to palpate feet to small parts, D, all of the above. Again, if you're using the same analogy that I just used in the previous question, you know that all these are features of polyhydramnios, so all of the above would be the answer. So question 39, second trimester oligohydramnios may be attributed to which of the following conditions? A, poor, perfusion, poor placental perfusion, B, rupture of fetal membranes, C, bladder outlet obstruction, D, all of the above. So second trimester oligohydramnios. So remember in oligohydramnios, it's either that there is a reduction in the production of amniotic fluid or there is increase in absorption of the amniotic fluid. So most likely all of the above causes can result in oligohydramnios in the second trimester. Question 40. Which prenatal exposure is associated with an increased risk of childhood thyroid cancer? A. Lead, lithium, mercury, and radioiodine. Uh, I think I did this question before in the previous video. I don't know. I should actually go and check. If I've done it before, please comment in the section below that you've done question 40 before. So the answer is most likely radioiodine. So question 41, what is the most common sex chromosome abnormality? A, 45X, B, 47XXX, C, 47XYY, D, 47XXY. So you should know what these conditions are. Option A is one condition. Option B and C and D are variants. Option B and C are variants. Um, option D is also another condition. Anyways. So the answer there is most likely option D, which is Kleinefelter. That's the most common uh, sex chromosome abnormality. So what is the most common cause of hemolytic disease in newborns? So that's A, alpha thalassemias, B, ABO incompatibility, C, recess alloimmunization, D, glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase deficiency. I already know what most of you are going to be picking, and most of you are going to be screaming the answer C to the screen. And of course, C is incorrect. The answer is B. ABO incompatibility. Then question 43, which test should be performed to quantify the appropriate dose of anti-D immune globulin needed to treat an at-risk patient? A, rosette test, B, indirect Coombs test, C, cluha beticate test, D, all of the above. If you have no idea what these tests are, please spend the time now to pause the video, Google them up, and then come back and answer the question. But most likely, this is a cluha beticate test. Question 44, what are the goals of antepartum fetal surveillance? A, prevent fetal death. B, indicate timing of intervention. C, improve negative predictive values of for antenatal testing. D, all of the above. And I know most of you will be rushing for all of the above given that that has been the answer in the previous uh, questions, but you would indeed get it wrong because the answer is A, prevent fetal death. So question 45, we are left with a few more questions before we end this session. Biophysical profiles are composed of all except which of the following? A, fetal tone, B, fetal breathing, C, contraction stress test, D, amniotic fluid volume measurement. So we know that biophysical profile is one of the ways in which we can use to assess the uh, state of the fetus. So a contraction stress test is not part of a biophysical profile. So what controls fetal heart rate accelerations? A, aortic baroreceptor reflex. B, carotid baroreceptor reflexes. C, autonomic functions at the brainstem level. D, humoral factors such as atrionatriuretic peptide. So you can pause the video right now, but most likely this is due to the autonomic function of the brainstem. Remember that the, it's either parasympathetic or sympathetic output from the brainstem. Whenever the uterus contracts and there is compression of the head, there is increase in parasympathetic outflow 
therefore reducing the heart rate, causing fetal decelerations. When this abates, then there is parasympathetic or sympathetic output from the brainstem, increasing the heart rate, causing the accelerations. And there is also perfusion of the baby with blood. Which of the following is the most common cause of first trimester pregnancy loss? A. Uterine anomalies. B. Incompetent cervix. C. Intrauterine infection. D. Chromo fetal chromosomal abnormalities. So most likely that these are fetal chromosomal abnormalities. Question 48. Effective prevention of miscarriage in women with threatened abortion include which of the following? A. Bed rest. B. McDonald's circulate. And I'm not talking about McDonald's, the food. C, human chorionic gonadotrophin injection. D, none of the above. I know most of you, again, are going to be guessing A, bed rest. But actually, what we have realized is that there is nothing that is effective in preventing the threatened abortion. Uh, and of course, if it's going to happen, it's going to happen. It's going to progress to an abortion, which is either incomplete or complete. So none of the above can actually help. Incomplete abortion may be treated successfully with which of the following? A. Observation. B. Dilatation and curatage. C. Prostaglandin E. Administration. D. All of the above. So again, most of you are going to be screaming D and C, the dilatation and curatage, but most likely all of the above is the answer because you can observe them. Sometimes they do actually progress to complete abortion. In some cases, you can perform a D and C and you can give prostaglandin E drugs. Missed abortions may be treated successfully with which of the following? A. Observation. B. Dilatation and curatage. C. Prostaglandin E1 administration as well as all of the above. Again, this is similar to with the incomplete abortions. All of the above can be used in the management of this condition. Question 51. Which of the following defines heterotropic pregnancy? A. One tubal and one abdominal pregnancy. B. One ectopic and one intrauterine pregnancy. C. Two pregnancies. One in each fallopian tube, D, two ectopic pregnancies in one fallopian tube. So here in heterotropic pregnancy is just simply one ectopic pregnancy plus one intrauterine pregnancy. Question 52, which of the following is least likely to increase the risk factor for ectopic pregnancy? Note that these are all risk factors of ectopic pregnancy, but which is least likely? A, prior pelvic infection, B, prior hydatidy for Mo, C, prior ectopic pregnancy, D, salpingitis isthmica nodosum. So you may pause the video and remember it's not good to go for something that you don't know. So most of you guessed D, but the answer is actually B, a prior hydatidy for Mo. So question 53, with contraceptive failure, which method has a relative increased risk for ectopic pregnancy a condoms b vasectomy c tubal sterilization d all of the above which of the following has an increased risk of ectopic pregnancy so if we sterilize the tube tubal sterilization then it's most likely that you can have some ectopic pregnancies there vasectomies and condoms there's no risk then gestational trophoblastic neoplasia includes all except which of the following i know there'll be big arguments here a invasive moles B, choriocarcinoma, C, partial hydatidy for Mo, D, placental site trophoblastic tumor. You may pause the video here, but the answer is C, a partial hydatidy from Mo. Question 55, the hallmark sign of gestational trophoblastic neoplasia is which of the following? A, seizures, B, hemoptysis, C, uterine bleeding, D, pelvic thrombosis. The hallmark of gestational trophoblastic neoplasia is which of the following? So, most likely uterine bleeding, which is C. Question 56. During which of the stages of labor is the fetus delivered? Stage 1, stage 2, stage 3, stage 4. So remember, each of these stages have uh, different names. You should know these stages, but if you do know these stages, you know that the fetus is delivered at stage 2. Question 57. According to Friedman, the minimum normal rate of active phase labor in a multipara is which of the following? 1 cm per hour, 1.2 cm per hour, 1.5 cm per hour, 3.4 cm per hour. Remember that progression of labor in multiparous women is much faster than progression of labor in naliparous women. But the rule of thumb is that all women should see one sunrise and, or more than one sunrise and one sunset in labor. So it shouldn't 
last longer than this. So most likely this woman uh, should have a minimum rate of 1.5 centimeter per hour. Question 58. When does the latent phase of labor end for most women? A. 1 to 2 centimeters. B. 2 to 3 centimeters. C. 3 to 5 centimeters. D. 7 to 8 centimeters. Again, this is one of the things where you either know it or you don't. So remember that the, from the latent phase of labor, you're going to the active phase of labor, which is usually when someone is 4 centimeter dilated. So between 3 to 5 centimeters. So question 59, which is a clinical scenario case. So a patient has a blood pressure of 110 over 72 millimeters of mercury on her first prenatal visit at eight weeks gestation. She develops hypertension in the third trimester and at delivery, her blood pressure is 148 over 94 millimeters of mercury. Urine protein by dipstick is trace. Her creatinine level is 0.76 milligrams per deciliter. Her hypertension has resolved by the time of her hospital discharge. What is her correct diagnosis? A. Preeclampsia. B. Chronic hypertension. C. Gestational hypertension. D. Superimposed preeclampsia. So you may pause the video at any point. So we already established that this woman before the 20th week didn't have hypertension because her blood pressure was normal. Even at eight weeks, her blood pressure was normal. So already that rules out chronic hypertension. That rules out superimposed hypertension because they would have had a chronic hypertension in the background. So it rules out B and D. Now we'll look at this woman. She has a high BP, okay, fine, but she doesn't have that much proteins in her urine. They are trace. So most likely preeclampsia is also out of the window. And in addition to this, it resolves when this person has been discharged from the hospital. So most likely within the puparium. So most likely this woman has a gestational hypertension. The last and indeed final question Fetuses of avert diabetic mothers have an increased risk of which of the following? A. Preterm delivery. B. Spontaneous abortions. C. Congenital malformations. D. All of the above. You may pause the video at this point to scream the answer at your screen. And if you indeed screamed the answer D, you are indeed correct. So patients of uh, fetuses of overtly diabetic mothers are at risk of preterm delivery, spontaneous abortions, and even congenital malformations. It's now that time of the video where you get to grade yourself. If you have scored between 50 to 60, then it's, you're pretty excellent. You're pretty good at the course. Keep doing what you're doing. If you're between 40 to 49, you probably should study smart and take your time to actually notice the subtle things. If you're between 30 to 39, which is a fair thing, you should spend your time reading the much more relevant things to improve your grade. If you're between 25 to 29, you're an average person, so don't be too comfortable with actually getting the bare minimum. Then if you scored between 20 to 24, that's below average, so you should just change your study methods and you should seek some help. Anyone who scored below 20, please reach out. You can reach out to me in the comment section below. I'm always available and I'm always too ready to assist in however I can. Thank you for spending your time to listen to this uh, episode on Shotgun Q&A. If you enjoyed it, please drop a like, drop a comment to show some support. Also subscribe to the channel, hit the bell notification icon, tell a friend to tell a friend that we are making your dreams come true. Subscribe, share, comment to Zambia and beyond. My name is Dr. Moses Kazevu. Until next time, 